Great. Hello and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk featuring Heather Lendy in conversation with Jessica Handler. I'm Kate Whitman, the Vice President of Author Programs and Community Engagement for the Atlanta History Center. I'm really glad that you're here and thanks for bearing with us. This talk will also be broadcast on C-SPAN, so look out for that. You can purchase copies of Bears and Ballots directly from our official bookseller, Acapella Books. There is actually a link in the chat so that you can do that. Also, we provided a link on our website. As Jessica and Heather are talking, please submit your questions for Heather or for Jessica, if Jessica will entertain questions as well. I will. Um, <laughs> via the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will get to as many of those as time allows. Heather Lendy has contributed essays and commentary to NPR, the New York Times, and National Geographic Traveler, among other newspapers and magazines. She's the author of the best-selling books, Find the Good, Take Good Care of the Garden and the Dog, and if you lived here, I'd know your name. Tonight, she'll be discussing her latest book of Bears and Ballots, an Alaskan adventure in small town politics. Heather will be interviewed by Jessica Handler. Jessica Handler is the author of the novel, The Magnetic Girl, winner of the 2020 Southern Book Prize. Um, it was also a nominee for the Townsend Prize for Fiction. Her memoir, Invis Invisible Sisters, was named one of the books all Georgians should read and her craft guide, Braving the Fire, a guide to writing about grief and loss, was praised by Vanity Fair magazine and many others. She teaches creative writing and directs the minor in writing at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. She lectures internationally in writing, and we are so delighted that she is joining us tonight. Um, Heather and Jessica, welcome, and I will let Jessica take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Heather, um, I'm so glad to talk to you. I feel like you're a friend, although we've only sort of met on the internet in the past few weeks. I love this book so much. And while I personally don't have the temperament to run for office, um, and you do apparently, you and I share deep beliefs in the importance of community and the importance of democracy. And it's just a real honor to spend some time with you tonight. Thank you. Um, I wanna know if you would read for us just sure. the very beginning of Bears, of, of Bears and Ballots. If you would read from um, the beginning, Election Day, through My Life is an Open Book. It's the first three paragraphs. Oh, uh, sure. Um, election Day. There are two polling places in Haines. One is in the Art Center lobby on the hill above the harbor and the cruise ship dock. The other is at the Fire Hall in Mosquito Lake, a woodsy rural settlement 26 miles out of town. I voted at the Art Center and said hi to everyone as I walked in but I didn't say wish me luck or anything close to it. The public radio station, KHNS, and signs on the street corners reminded residents that no campaigning was allowed at or near polling places. One neighbor who lives in an old house with a wide porch on Soap Suds Alley was asked by the borough clerk to remove campaign signs from his yard since his home was too close to the polls. I did notice who was there voting though, friends and foes, and wondered which side of the Haynes right-left divide would be victorious. Either way, a little more than half of us would be happy and a little less than half would be disappointed. Haynes is predictable. I assumed it would be close. It looked to me as though more conservative voters than my supporters were at the Art Center that morning. I hoped my years in town, my community service on the library board, the hospice board and planning commission, my volunteer hosting of the local country music show on KHNS, coaching high school runners for 17 years, five good children and five grandchildren, the sixth, seventh, and actually now there's 11 because of a combined family, our family business, Lutec Lumber, which my husband Chip runs, plus all those obituaries I've been writing for the Chilcat Valley News since 1997 would give me crossover support. How much further do you want me to keep going? Um, you can stop there. Okay, That's I wasn't fine. sure, I'm sorry. I was a little nervous being kind of in your presence. Oh gosh, don't say that. <laughs> um, well, we can stop there because what I wanted to do was the voice in this book, which is your voice obviously, mm -hmm. is so present and so warm. And I also was really stopped by the fact that there is a street in your town called Soap Suds Alley. Yeah. And the map, there's a map in the fonts piece of this book on the subject of Soap Suds Alley that gives a reader a sense of the charm and the smallness of Haynes and mm -hmm. your love and commitment to this place where you've been for, for a long time. 
Um, yes, I loved having a map there. It's my first book with a map, and people have always asked me. And so I asked my friend, who was also on the Borough Assembly with me, yeah. if she would like to draw it. It's just fantastic. It reminds me of a children's book, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, you know, you write in the book that you ran for local office in Haynes to help set an example. And I'm curious, in what ways did, you, did your experience set an example, and for whom? What's the example setting? Well, I think, well, I was, I was running, you know, thinking my grandchildren would talk about their grandmother, you know, who yeah. was involved in local government. And I was thinking in my life, how influential my, the women, my mothers and grandmothers were and the things that they did that I didn't even realize at the time that have become part of the way I live and the things that I respect in people. So I thought, well, I, I want to show them that they need to be involved in in their community and in their government. And I want to talk about the grandma that was on the assembly and remember me typing my notes for meetings or talking yeah. and I, um, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> I didn't become like the, the local star of the assembly or anything. Um, but what I did do is because I was thinking of that all the time, I, I realized about halfway in or maybe even sooner than that, that what I was gonna bring to it was a, a kind of, uh, sounds hokey but a kind of civility kindness yeah um that i wasn't going to do anything that that i wouldn't want them to be proud of me for even if I, I might not be winning particular battles or uh you know being revered by certain people for my politics it, it was different than that it was like i'm going to show them how to behave in the yeah. in the public eye when the chips are down a little and how and the you tips were down for you for a period. Yeah, and and a how and also how you how you talk to your neighbors, even the ones that you disagree with, especially publicly. Yeah, you know, you might. I, I mean, I'm not a saint or anything. I I might rant and rave or yell a little bit in my talks with my friend Beth, but publicly, I always tried. If you know that old adage, if I couldn't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Yeah, and really try to find some something in either my fellow assembly members, the mayor, the staff, or the people who were kind of giving us such a hard time to, to appreciate in them. Yeah. And that helped. And I want to ask you about the hard time that you refer to, which is the recall or the attempt mm -hmm. at a recall. But then I also want to talk about, at one point I was, when I was reading the book, I started circling how many times the word kindness or respect or listen showed up in the text. And it's really a theme in there. So will you talk to us a little bit about, A, about the, the hard time, the, the attempt at the recall, and how kindness and respect and listening, even to people you don't disagree with, contributes to democracy? Well, I guess first the, the recall, which, um, you know, as, as you so <laughs> um, clearly put, I wish I'd read your book on grief before I wrote about it, because I actually had <laughs> A lot of stuff about the recall There's because all you know kinds that of was the, kinds the of grief, hurt yeah. part, and the it was really grief. It was grief for the town that I thought I'd lived in. It, it during that time it sort of felt personal, like a like almost a divorce. Like my town had cheated on me in many so ways. What did happen? Well, what happened happen? happen was um, right after myself and uh, my friend Tom Warford, who's the editor of the Chilcot Valley News, were elected um, uh, on a uh, basically a fairly um, we were more progressive perhaps than the other uh, uh, people running. There were six people running and, and Tom and I were the top two vote getters and got the seats. And we joined an assembly that was already leaning more progressive in that Haynes right left. Um, if that's the right word, it's hard in a small town, it doesn't always line up the way it does mm -hmm. nationally. Those don't necessarily mean the same things, but uh, there was an issue about the Harbor and an expansion there. And we had run on the idea that the community should have a referendum, get to vote on the design of it. And um, that, that's why we were elected. And so we thought just before we got in, right after we got in, well, we, we better get that um, happening. And uh, that created a lot of anger and from the people who had supported that particular design. And so right away, and it didn't happen, the rest of the assembly with the mayor breaking the tie that uh, was three to four. So there was going to be no referendum. And even though, uh, similar to national politics in a way, they won, they were so mad that we had even wanted to do that, that pretty much the next day we're going to recall you. Okay. And then it just became a, something that hung over us so that at every meeting, 
how that works if, you know, there's always somebody that's unhappy with the decision. Well, then they could get their signature on the petition. And, and it, it snowballed like that through pretty much the first, uh, well, it was the first nine months that I was on office. The, my second election was in August and my first one had been the previous October. And you came out the other side of it. The recall was stopped, right? Yes. Um, yeah. It was myself and, t and two other assembly members, Tom, who had been recently elected, and then an artist, a local artist, mm -hmm. um, was also yeah. the, the third one. Um, and uh, the really good news about it w was that the town um, didn't go for it. I mean, they recognized, my, my community recognized that it was pretty squirrely. And huh. so it was a 60-40. Yeah. And the other really nice thing was it wasn't, personal. It, it, they didn't choose which one of the three that were targeted they'd rather have or not. It, it was straight across. We all pretty much just got the same number of votes. And, and it was a resounding no to that kind of politics in Haynes. And that was good. Which goes to the next part of the question, which is you really emphasize in this book kindness and respect and listening um, to people regardless of if they agree with you or don't agree with you. So how do traits like that contribute to a functioning community in your mind? The ability to listen and be kind and fair. Oh, I think, I think it's the only way you're gonna have a functioning community. I mean, it's just human nature. If, if, if somebody is standing there calling you names, saying that you're stupid, saying bad things about your family, you, you know, you're probably not gonna wanna listen to them the next time they stand up and they start talking about why they need a sewer line expansion to their neighborhood. Yeah. You know, you're, you'll, you'll, it's just, it's human nature that you back up from people that aren't, aren't, aren't communicating with you well. And, and if you can at least find some way to be, for lack of a, a better word, polite, yeah. um, it helps. It helps a lot. And I, I noticed that watching people when they came to assembly meetings and talking. I could listen to a long time to somebody that I completely disagree with if they spoke to me in a calm way. Yeah. But if they just, you know, were going like this and yelling, you're back. Yeah. You know, I had a friend who was a mayor um, in, in another small Alaskan town. And she told me, you know, think of, think of public service this way. Every time you shove, if you shove somebody, they shove you back. But if you just are kind of, leaning against them eventually <laughs> they might lean this way or come towards you yeah. but it's an easier way to to nudge somebody than than a, a slam in the shoulder yeah it makes sense that's and that's a hard lesson to learn there's a section in the book that i well i love the whole book i don't want to say there's a section i loved because then that implies that there weren't other ones when you go to the bath the community bath in a rural community will you talk about that section i loved reading that section and you you know and you make it a metaphor for for the common good yeah Tell well that, that, that was at the very beginning of the book i i needed a campaign manager you know and way it was all small but it was big you know oh you're gonna have a campaign and my friend teresa mm -hmm. um said oh i'll be your campaign manager and teresa's a you know go-getter a retired elementary school teacher and everybody loves her and she has a cabin in a tiny town called Teneke springs and the town has a public bath. It's a, a warm springs with the bathhouse on top. And um, that, that's where you go to bathe. And I, I had always wanted to go to Teneke. And travel in Alaska is challenging. And even in Southeast Alaska, even though Teresa had had the place for years and I'm a close friend, I'd never been out there. And um, it involves ferry rides or float planes to get there. And, um, <laughs> And we went just before I declared my candidacy because she had a book club there that I was going to go talk to. And um, I, I thought, you know, maybe the, that the bath was um, not, not as public as it was, I guess. And, and, and we get down there and it's time to go bathe and there's women's hours and men's hours. And, and it's a little old fashioned bathhouse and it sort of smells like sulfur. And then there's this sign that says, no bathing suits, nude bathing only. And you, and I'm thinking, well, maybe it'd be dark in there anyway, <laughs> but you go down <laughs> into this grotto and it's sort of concrete and there's a big skylight, old fashioned skylight. And there you are like in your birthday suit. And there are other women in the town there and yeah. of all ages, sizes, shapes, and you're bathing together. 
and I, I did a talk there um, on a, a book about obituary writing, and um, it was completely different having been in the bath with people because you just realize how you know the scars, the things, our our bodies, ourselves, what we what we put on top of each other all you know all the uh -huh. time is so different, and and that made me think mm. that if if we all had to bathe together. Yeah. we would probably be a lot nicer to each other. That's lovely. It's a metaphor for the common good. And again, maybe not listening, but looking as a version of listening, right? In terms yeah. of seeing people as people. You, you, there's a lot of stuff in this book about democracy, but it's also about the community and it's also about your life and your parenting and grandparenting, and to some extent your faith and your upbringing. Can you talk a little bit about what drives you to think this way and, and why, you know, why you decided to run for office and why you understand something that's hard for me to do, which is listen to people who disagree with me? Where does that come from in you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've always had a lot of empathy, but I think a lot of it, when I look back, comes from my mother and the school, I, I grew up going to a Quaker school. Right. And so there was, you know, very much that, you know, the Quakers teach you that there is that of God in every man, you know, and that's why they're pacifists or woman, but that's why there's a little spark in there that is holy in all of us. And that, that runs through a lot of faith traditions. And then I'm a, I'm a regular uh, practicing Episcopalian. I go to church on Sunday and you hear all those lessons and it might yeah. sound wrote to people. My husband sometimes calls it the fill in the blank church because of all, but, but you're reminded every Sunday, you know, the things yeah. done and left undone, that you yeah. have to care for people that even, you know, even the idea of forgiving um, people only God will forgive you only as much as you forgive others. You know, that has just been ingrained in me. And so yeah. it's part of my value system. And while again, I, I'm no, I fall short a lot, especially when I'm in public, I feel like that's what you have to do. Your best foot goes forward. That's what all these lessons are for, for when mm -hmm. there you are in a leadership yeah. role in a community, that's when those come into my decision-making. Sure, right. there's code and sure there's the constitution, there's all these other things, but it's the how you get there comes from that background, I think. Yeah, and in terms of being an assembly person, um, you have a section in the book about Robert's Rules of Order which, I, I mean, I don't even understand Robert's Rules of Order. I know what it is, but it's so procedural. I just go, la, la, la. Um, was it hard to learn that? Is, this is a hard job, what you were doing, just on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, it was, you know, anybody, I've been on boards, and, and you know, there's, there's always the, you make a motion in a second, and you vote, but Robert's Rules can get very complicated, and if yeah. the people who are holding you to them if you're not sure what you do to second an amendment or remove an amendment or <laughs> how this all happens um you can get stuck and at the beginning um sometimes uh, it felt as if people were using perhaps my lack of knowledge in that against you when they they didn't they wanted to make sure you couldn't have something happen they say oh no no that's not they make this motion you're like what it just yeah. got tabled i didn't even get to talk about it and so i and then i said well this isn't just a bunch of hooey. I better learn how to do it. And there is a certain um, built-in decorum to it. You right. know, Madam Mayor, you call each other Assemblyman Morford or Assembly Member Josephson. You know, there's mm -hmm. uh, the manager. People in a small town that we all know by our first names. I mean, Alaska, it's a very informal place. Mm -hmm. um, my, my children call their school teachers by their first name outside of school. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and you call the doctor, the you know, the our priest at church. It's all first name basis, mm -hmm. and so being in the assembly is just odd. And then even once people speak to the assembly, when they stand up, they have to give their full name. You know, this is Don Turner Jr., and I'm saying this now, even though we all know who it is. Right. That's just part of the protocol. And you've written obituaries for their families. They shop at your hardware store and lumber yard. It's yes. It's sort of like two aspects of the same community. Really, uh, on the assembly, even the people who are just even up on the, the day is for the mayor. I, I wrote the mayor's husband's obituary. I wrote her nephews, um, uh, other members of her family, you know, Tresham's family. I wrote his parents. Um, you know, if I went around the room at any given time, 
there's four or five people in there that I have been involved with them in a very um, kind of intimate time in their life. Yeah, yeah. You t in the book, you chat with, you have a, a, a section where you're chatting with a native author named Ernestine Hayes, right? Mm -hmm. And she's visiting your house and she's sort of held over because of weather, right? Yes. And yes. you end up having a really deep conversation about difficult topics having to do with racism and privilege and mm -hmm. collective memory, I guess. Yeah. And, and this idea comes up again later in the book when there's a community tragedy that's been kind of covered up over, mm -hmm. I guess, a generation. Um, you talk about collective silence, and I'm wondering how, I, I don't know that politics is the right word, but how being a member of a community or being uh, a representative of a community as you are, how does that help guide a community out of collective si silence and grow in a positive way? So what I'm asking is, how does talking about difficult subjects or confronting a difficult past in a community help a community grow? Do you think? I think, well, I think what it does when, and, and this is why I, I had that conversation with my friend Ernestine. I think mm -hmm. a lot of times, and I can only speak for myself in this, sure. you don't want to bring up these things that might be issues of race, injustice, uh, uh, abuse that's happened. Unless someone brings it up to you first, you feel like that's not my place. Is that gossip? Am, am I being nosy? You know, there's a, in a small town, you're, you're trying to keep privacy. For different things too. We, we have this interesting balance where we might know what everybody's up to, but we don't say so. <laughs> um, sure. To give them sort of a, a veil of privacy, I guess. And um, But like in talking with Ernestine and then shining the light on that, uh, in, in the privacy of my living room, we could talk. She could, she could talk about things that she had grown up with. This is an Alaska Native woman who was, I mean, she has an incredible story. She was yeah homeless at 50 and a college professor by the time she was 70. And she's the state writer laureate. She's written a beautiful book called The Tao of Raven, another one blonde Indian. But, um, you know, in public, Ernestine and I might, it, it might be awkward to have a conversation like you and I are having because neither one of us would want to say the wrong thing or have it right. interpreted the wrong way. There's so much of that yeah. involved. And the same with the other situation in the community where, you know, this horrible past crime was uncovered and it turned out that people kind of had an idea about that but it never nobody ever said anything and now i think especially com community leaders it's and i this has come through loud and clear i think with the black lives matter especially those of us that are uh, privileged mm -hmm. white we're, we're supposed to say stuff we're supposed to say hey this isn't right i don't think this is right and we're supposed to call people out on it publicly and you can do it politely. I mean, Ernestine, every time she speaks, she's a, she's a, the, just a, a wonderful, nice grandmotherly person, dimples, sparkly eyes. She writes about very hard things in a, in a way that's, it's almost like Angela's ashes. There's a lightness yeah. to, and, and well, you've done it in your books, you know, the way you sorrow and tragedy, but with a, a love for her, her family the way you have a love for yours and, yeah. and it's challenging but she ends all of her speeches with she puts her fist up and she says smash the patriarchy and she does this in front of governors in front of her and you just want to stand up and cheer to me that's the same as um people who go to church that can hold their hands up i'm uh -huh. i'm still kind of episcopalian so i can't do the waving thing <laughs> i just love it when people do you know yeah. so moved and she does it in such a way that it's coming from love not Hate. And it's like, yeah. this is what I'm going to do. And she says that at the end of every time she speaks. And so that's a way that a leader, here she was, the Alaska Writer Laureate, a Native woman, said to heck with it, I'm going to do this every time. And she did. And nobody got mad at her about it, or maybe they did, but they didn't say so. You know, yeah. we all worry how, how those things sometimes will play yeah. out in public. And she she did that. And I, I, I love her for it. I think you're doing it in a bears and ballots as well, in a way, because you're talking about in the book, you're writing about community disagreements or you're writing about difficult spots in a community's history mm -hmm. and how people in the community, you specifically, because it's a memoir, um, <laughs> take a stand and speak up and encourage people to look at their community, look at themselves and make change. Do you think that's what a fair assessment? Well, one of my favorite characters in the book is Ray Meneker, who was the um, yeah. 
a longtime newspaper editor and who came to characters in the book in my life. I mean, this yeah. is the stage that I live in, but uh, Ray came to Haynes in 1955, a Navy veteran, Columbia grad, Jewish from New York to teach French yeah. in Haynes, Alaska in 1955, a logging town and really in 1955, really in the middle of nowhere because that's pre anything, not even a radio station or TV, you know? Yeah. And Ray brought this idea of culture and urbaneness. And then he started the, uh, a student newspaper that became our local paper that's still in existence. Mm -hmm. um, he and his students just started publishing the regular news he thought there should be. He helped found a public radio station. He, um, the local conservation group that uh, is responsible for a lot of preserved land around here. And um, he also served on the borough assembly for seven terms as a uh, socialist <laughs> and they used to at one point um he was called red ray they, uh -huh. they nicknamed him red way the, the 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 powers that be and um he he went right to the source of that rumor and explained the difference between socialism and communism and assured them that he wasn't a communist yeah. and you know he um i i just i see the legacy that he left in one small town and that's still here Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have the radio station. We still have the local players group. We still have a, a very strong conservation group. Um, we still have a newspaper. And that's Ray, you mm -hmm. know, for one person in a small town that isn't exactly what you think of as your stereotypical Alaskan, but very much so. Tell us, he's a great character. I loved reading about him and I wished that I could meet him somehow. Something about the people in this book makes me want to reach into the pages and go, Get, come have a beer with me. Come have coffee with me. Tell me more about this. Tell us about some of the other characters in the book. I realize they're real people, but in a memoir, they're also characters. Well, I mean, my one of my uh, favorites is uh, Stephanie, who mm -hmm. um, is a, a former mayor and a retired special ed teacher, and a, she has a flower farm now, and she grows flowers and delivers them uh, everywhere, around town, to boats, to motel rooms, whatever people want, fresh flowers all summer. But um, Stephanie uh, is a you know, diminutive person with a great big dog. And she uh, is a Buddhist, <laughs> but was raised as a Quaker. And she really helped me when I was first on the assembly, I would go out to see her and say, what am I doing? They're yelling at me and screaming. And she gave me um, uh, this book, um, Choosing Civility. By, yes, you um, write about that. Yeah, by P.M. Forney. Great mm -hmm. book. Anybody who is thinking about running for office, who is just thinking about living in the world a little better, this is a wonderful uh, book. It's the 25 Rules of Considerate Conduct. And um, he's the co-founder of the Johns Hopkins Civility Project. And, you know, it's a, I just, it really, really helped me. And Stephanie had all this stuff in here underlined and circled from when she was the mayor. And then what happened was we ended up, um, people quit, there was all kinds of controversy, and we ended up appointing Stephanie to a seat um, during a, a really serious illness. Right. And um, so that was overshadowing us. But I think the fact that she was there during that time um, made us all realize that what we were doing wasn't life and death. Yeah. yeah. And our arguments weren't. And here we had somebody that had obviously just, you know, had, had, in a headscarf and, and cancer and a service dog with her. And yet she wanted to be on the assembly and help. Mm -hmm. And that, that changed for me. I could just feel the room change when she came in because of that. And of course we all know that we're all terminal in a way, but to mm -hmm. have that someone saying, Hey, I'm here to, to do this for the community. And this, and I know that I might not have as much time as the rest of you. That, that was a, a real game changer. She's setting an example the way you intend to send it, set an example in a different way, but she also set an example for you. Yeah, very much so. And, yeah. and sitting next to her then really helped me because she, she would just say, she'd put her hand on my knee and she'd say, Heather, just don't say anything. Just vote. <laughs> you know, just vote. You can vote. You can. And, and that was just very, very helpful. And then the one time I went to her, I was like, I, mean, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to quit. And she said, oh, and she talks, oh, don't be silly. She said, don't be silly. She said, just don't go to the next meeting. And I was like, <laughs> you can do that? And she's like, sure you can. You have to, if you miss three, then they can kick you off. And just knowing that I had a back door, I never used it. But I felt like then, oh, 
okay, if it, if it just looks like it's going to be too much for me, I can just not go. And then knowing that empowered me yes. in a way. So yes. we so all need a Stephanie. Another great one. And then, uh, you know, Tom Warford, the editor of the Chilcot Valley News, is, you know, tilting at windmills and fighting the man. And, and he'd reported on it for years. And he had lots of issues about, you know, kind of the inertia of government and the slowness and the bureaucracy or the police. He had all these things. And he just would rail at it. Uh, Tresham, artist. Um, th there's, there's many. And I'm sure they are everywhere. But yeah. I just happen to adore the ones that I'm around all the time, and even the ones I disagree with. I mean, it comes through. So it comes through so beautifully. I've got two or three more questions, and, and then I want to go to the audience because I can see the little red numbers coming up oh. that you have questions. Thank you. Of women and politics and leadership, because that's a real topic in this book, too. You write, what is this expectation that we should, we being women, we should make everything okay and everyone comfortable? What is this expectation? So what is that expectation and what do we do about it? Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I wrestled with that and I don't know if it's generational, if it's my family. I hate to paint this broad brush and say women this is how we all are because right. we all know that we're all different and that in and of itself is diminishing so um but the way i was raised you know was that you're the person in the room that's the good hostess <laughs> everybody have enough to eat is your chair comfortable is it warm enough cold enough you want me to open a window you know i'll put the dog out you know if it's he's bothering you it comes a dog oh, there is. um <laughs> see Daddy, yeah, you, can see, you can see her. <laughs> oh, there she is. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Golden retriever. But um, uh, I, I wondered about that. By the time I got done, I felt like um, I, I had more courage to be okay if people weren't comfortable with it, as long as I was comfortable more with myself. And, you know, that's, a, that's just an ongoing yeah. issue um, yeah. of, of how to be public in, and, and not bring your kind of your private expectations, how to separate that. One of, the, one of the best pieces of advice I got was from one of the managers who said to me, you know, sat me down, I was having a tough time, she said, Heather, you've raised five children, right? I'm like, yeah, and she goes, and they're, they're pretty good. I said, yeah, they're all, they're all contributing citizens and good people. And she said, she said, did you give them everything they wanted all the time? Didn't sometimes they get mad at you? Didn't they not like your rules? Didn't you have rules from, I said, you bet I did. She goes, okay, when you come in here, put your mother brain on. You can still love them all, but tell them, no, you're not gonna get that pair of shoes. And no, you have to go to bed now. And yes, you have to get up and we're gonna do the firewood today. You know, those kind of things. And that really helped me that I could yes. still like everybody, but I could be, instead of the hostess, right. I could be the mother who's, as my kids used to say, the boss of this place. The boss of the place. <laughs> And that, that helped me tremendously then when yeah. I put that, because I mean, some of these people I didn't even like, and I was worried about how they were, but that's a hostess does that. But it's, a mother. It's a, it's a good way to put on a different brain or to look at it through a different mm -hmm. lens and give yourself, I don't know if the word is more power, but maybe a different way to navigate a challenge. Well, I know, I know that, um, you know, I can uh, love someone and not trust them, for instance, which sometimes happens with teenagers. <laughs> and and, and I, I mean, I adore them, but, you know, careful. There's things yeah. that could get, in, you know, they might not tell you the truth about where they went last night. And yeah. so, um, you know, and with all kinds of family members that happens. So I just started really thinking of the assembly members, as well as the audience more, or the residents who were in the room at our meetings more as, as family. Yeah. On the subject of love, I'm gonna ask you one last formal question and then we'll go to, go to the assembled. Um, you have a great love for Alaska. It's so clear. And you write about the wilderness, specifically the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in a trip you took there. And you're reading on that trip, her name is Marty, is it Murray? Marty yeah, Marty Murray. Murray. Marty Murray, and you, you quote her asking in, what, the 1920s, what, what is the most precious thing in a life? So I'm curious, what do you think, as a person who has contributed to the um, politics, the democracy of their community, a person who writes obituaries in a community, a person who contributes and thinks a lot about the health of their community and the well-being of their community, what makes a good life? 
do you know for you? Uh, for me, I think it's all about relationships. And I think that's why politics was the most challenging in a small town. I think it's about, you know, do you love well? Have you been loved? How do you take care of the people around you? I mean, I'm with Anthony Fauci, you know, and he says, I don't understand how to tell you to take care of everybody by wearing a mask. You know, I don't understand how to explain why you should love your neighbor, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, I think that's, that's it. The place that you're in, I think you should do everything you can to leave it at least as good as when you got there and hopefully a little better. You know, your little patch of ground that you're on, your community, your family, your friends. I mean, the, the, the way those relationships evolve are different with all kinds of people. It doesn't have to be like mine, you know, married mm -hmm. with five kids and grandchildren, but it's, uh, you know, I have another friend, my dear friend Beth, you know, never had any children, has this whole family around her that she's created these relationships for years and years by caring for people, by being fair, by doing good, by being generous in your, in your community. And it doesn't mean, you know, sure, you can write checks, but, you know, it's more than that. It's volunteering and being part of things. Yeah, yeah. Heather, I feel so inspired. You've inspired <laughs> me. Let's see, shall we go to questions? How do we do that? Does Kate do that or do I do that? I didn't ask. Um, I think I what know. we do is we go to the q and I think I do it. And we've got one person who says, um, many Americans are focused on national politics, particularly the presidential election, instead of lo how local officials have an impact on their daily lives. How have you educated your community on those roles and participation in the process? And how can we convince more women to run for local office? So it's a double header there. Well, I don't think I've really educated my community very well. They've educated me <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the, I think Haynes is a, is a place where everybody is highly aware of local issues and, and not so much national. I mean, national, sure, people might argue about that in a coffee shop or at the bar or something, but in general, they'll argue more about what's on the assembly agenda. Um, yeah, they tend to line up in camps that could match the national but um, I mean, all the time I emphasize the local uh, and more and more for people. And we're seeing that now clearly. I mean, mm -hmm. issues of public health, issues of social justice, they come right down to decisions that are made every single meeting by small groups of people in small towns, medium towns, big towns, but just issues about hiring policies, issues about do, do the women who work at the library get paid less than the men who work for public works? Has anybody looked at that? I'm ashamed to say I didn't when I was on the assembly. It never occurred to me. And the, the, um, all the uh, uh, news in the last few months has brought that right front and center, even, even to the idea that our assembly meetings and many public meetings in small towns require you to be present to speak. And now we're all doing Zoom. Well, guess what? Even in Haines, my kids have been attending assembly meetings they've never gone before because they're home with little children it's 6 30 on a tuesday night they're working they're not going to go sit down in the moldy assembly chambers and wait to speak but now they can do it on zoom so maybe we need to change the process to get more people participating and that decision can be made at a local level yeah yeah and so i just think it's it's critical um the police local local people hire police departments they set the policies they put the budgets those things or how we live. Is that a way to convince, is that kind of participation a way to convince, as this questioner asked, more women to run for local office? I think so. I think it might be, if, and especially the other thing I would tell them now, you know, women are so busy, we have to do everything. Seems we gotta raise the kids, we gotta, we gotta cook the meals, and now we, now we have to run the place? You know, it's like, <laughs> come on. But, but, but we, don't we have can to maybe it. change it. We can maybe change how it's done. We can change, the times of the meetings. I mean, I thought about that again. When I was on the assembly, it never, it was always a pain, but I just thought, well, this is what I have to do. I have to leave before I can have dinner with my husband on those nights because he doesn't get home from work during, well, make the meeting later. Make it after you put the kids to bed. Put it on Zoom. Have it go eight to nine instead of five to 7.30 or something, which is about the worst time in the world for most mothers. For um, women, yeah. Yeah, it's impossible. You're just getting home and you have all those things to do and then it's politics. So I think, and I think women, um, I, I, frankly, and, and no offense to the men, but I think, you know, women are, 
are, are, are good at this because they see the things that matter to people. They, I think in general, women tend to be less, and this is, I don't want to be too um, whatever, but I mean, and I saw it regularly, the women spoke up more for families, for community, for uh, things that, uh, school um, and parks, and, and it seemed like men, it was all about business all the time. It was a lot about, you know, the money and, and not that the economy isn't important, mm -hmm. but I think, and, and women certainly contribute to it in a big way and have a lot to say about it. But why is daycare still such an issue? Get yeah. more women in there and just make it like normal. Like yeah. why, why do we have to go back to work like six weeks after having a baby? If you're lucky, if you mm -hmm. have that kind of insurance where every other country in the world, they give you some time. And then they tell you, you know, that the most important thing is to be with your kids. Well, how are you supposed to do that if you can't take off work? Yeah. I mean, that's why women need to get there because those children are our children and they're gonna be the leaders next. And we just need to get this right. I feel like your friend Ernestine, like, yes. <laughs> We've got another questioner who says, do you think Alaska might become more progressive? I do. I think right now, very interesting things are happening in Alaska because we have um, uh, a, a serious challenger to a Republican incumbent, Dan Sullivan, and, and Dr. Al Gross, who's a really good doctor and has operated on a lot of people's knees and hips and stuff, so we know him. And Alaska is a small state. Yeah. And he's also a commercial fisherman, so that helps. And he's, um, you know, he's not uh, super liberal, but he's a, he's a Democrat and he has a different sense, and especially healthcare right now with all that's going on. He's, yeah. He's, he's right there. And then we also have Elise Galvin, who is um, neck and neck with Don Young. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's, it is possible. And Lisa Murkowski, of course, is always kind of mm -hmm. a little more medium than you would think. And, um, you know, Alaskans um, tend to support her pretty well. So it, it's, it could happen. It very well could happen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from Gail O'Neill, who says, what did writing obituaries teach you about treading on sensitive terrain with grieving families? And then she wants to know if those lessons informed the way you approach third rail topics in politics. Uh, maybe. Uh, what, what, I guess my focus in writing obituaries, what I, what I did all the time was to find um, the good I wrote a book called that, but to, to look when, when someone dies and here, we all know everybody. The first thing I usually ask the family is tell me what you loved about them and be as specific as you can, because that everybody has different things. And then when they start doing that, the personality comes through. And, and so you do that. Then things like in terms of difficult topics, say, um, you know, somebody died of alcohol or took their own life. Uh, mm -hmm you know, th these things happen, as, as you know. Um, I, I, I usually ask them, how, how would you like us to handle this? Do, do you want to mention it? Do, do, is this important to you as a family to say something in the obituary or not? Um, uh, things like if there's been several marriages and they don't want to necessarily acknowledge them, I'm like, well, how can we do that? Maybe You've got children from them, so we'll put their last names in, but yeah. we don't need to mention that if you don't want to. I mean, I try. Um, and I also, I think the other thing, and this helps in politics, this, well, certainly finding the best in people, trying to find something in people that's okay. But the other one is, um, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're writing an obituary, you really, uh, you want to think about, um, what needs to be said and what doesn't need to be said. Yeah. And if there is say, you know, but you also want to capture their personality. So for instance, if there's somebody that was in a running feud with their neighbor, right? You don't quote the neighbor saying, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, she used to shoot over my head every time I went, you know, to get check on my chickens. Instead, you quote their best friend saying, oh gosh, you know, she was just in that feud for the rest of her life and you should have seen her. She'd go out there and fire that gun right over that guy's head every day. And then it's a compliment, you know, when a friend says yeah. it. So much of it is the messenger. And that's true in politics too. And, it, and I watched it. I don't know if I necessarily modeled it, but you know, when the basketball coach stands up and speaks up for clean water, mm -hmm. you know, the environmentalists in the room are, 
everybody's been hearing from them for weeks, but when the coach says, look, everybody knows you got to keep your water clean, bingo, the, yeah. the, the mind people or the development people will listen to him because it's a different voice. It's someone they trust. So it's and how so you deliver the message. It's how you deliver it's And it's the who. And still, it sometimes, sometimes comes down to who's saying it. Is it someone yeah. that they trust or is it someone that they don't? Yeah. So what haven't I asked you? You've been talking about of bears and ballots. You've been kind of touring digitally. And I know that there's stuff that I haven't hit on. What, what haven't I asked you that you want us to know? Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, the one, one thing I guess I would say is the importance in my life. What I learned, you know, through this book is that like you, you're changing all the time, you know, and ideas change and towns change and the ways of being change. And a lot of the book, when I look at it, and a lot of what happened in Haynes, and it's what's happening in the country now, has to do with people who want to go back to some kind of good old days and people who want to go forward. And really, they're the same thing. I mean, the good old days weren't yeah. so good. And, yeah. and everybody really wants the same thing. You know, they want, some, they want health and stability and enough to eat and to be safe and you know, have a job, um, you know, to go out in the park. And, and you know, I, and I think... I think finding that somehow and trying to govern ourselves with that moving forward, that, that might help, you know, especially as things roll into the, the fall and the election and the winter and that um, understanding that, uh, you know, that I think we're always gonna have the good old days, quote unquote, and we're always gonna have people that want change and that understanding that it's okay. One of the elders in Haynes, an old gal that was one of my dear friends who since passed away, um, who came here, you know, when to me, it was very romantic. There were steamships and everybody went to dances every Friday night and they all brought food to potlucks, you know? And I said to her, boy, don't you miss that? And we were sitting in more modern Haynes now. And yeah. she said, oh no, she said, are you kidding? It was so hard and it was all that snow and no, we didn't have a car and we didn't have a TV and I couldn't listen. I couldn't listen to my opera on the radio and look at all these well-appointed homes. And she said, you know, you gotta like change. If you don't, you know, if you don't like change, you die. It's like, it's like uh, what uh, C.S. Lewis said, you know, you can't go on being a good egg forever. You either, you either, you know, rot or you get eaten <laughs> or hatch or hatch. <laughs> or, yeah, rot, yeah, hatch or get eaten. Hatch. You know, I think we yeah. should hatch. Like we yeah. can hatch. We can keep going. And I learned even as a, a, a grandma on, on the assembly that I, I changed a lot. I wasn't, I'd be better at it now. And I got a lot of courage from it. Yeah. Yeah. You talk in the book about how we're living in the past, the present and the future sort of all at the same time, right? Yeah, that was a, from one of my uh, friends, a, a really fine Alaskan writer. If you're looking to learn about rural Alaska, Seth Kantner. He wrote a book mm -hmm. called Ordinary Wolves and Shopping for Porcupine. He writes a lot for Orion. And anyway, terrific yeah. writer. And he observed that in rural Alaska, we're living in the past, present, and future all at once because of climate change and the scope of development and the internet. You know, the world is coming in so fast to these places that were so remote that no wonder we're stressed. And then I realized, you know, that's how the whole country is right now. I mean, it seems like how the world is. Everything's zooming literally faster and faster. And we're we are, yeah. like, we don't have any control. And a lot of this is about leadership, even at a local level, state level, national level, just putting the brakes on saying, what is it that we all want and how can we get there? And that's what government does, right? It's just a, all, all government is, is a, is a sort of a collective agreement on the rules to live by. It's, it's, it's not some big bad thing. It's, this is what, what we need to do to live together in communities and states in a country. And these are the things that we all collectively agree are worth, you know, are our values. Last question. What's next for you, book-wise or life-wise? <laughs> I'm going to get through doing these Zoom events. Yeah. And um, I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll write another book. I don't know. I, um, um, right now, I'm uh, kind of treading water like we all are with the pandemic. I have a granddaughter in Juneau that I last saw my, on March 16th when I cut the umbilical cord. And then the state went into lockdown and I went home. I literally wow. saw her in the hospital and the next day flew home to Haines and I haven't seen her. And I'd love to somehow figure out how to see my daughters and grandchildren in Juneau. I have a son that lives in Australia. 
that I also mm -hmm. got to see just ahead of the pandemic. I was there in January, yeah. but I, um, and my dad, you know, these are the things that we're all, I'm all worried about the same things that everybody is. I have an elderly yeah. dad in, in New York and I, I'm worried about him living home alone. My sisters and I are, we're not there. Mm -hmm. um, so these are uh, pretty much, I'm taking it day by day. Yeah. And I'm sure I'll write about it all when I get sorted out. And it's again, a thought about community, family and community. Um, let's see, we don't have questions and I'm gonna look at the chat and somebody says the good old days weren't so good. Um, I wanna thank you. This has been wonderful and your voice is an important voice and a, just a pleasure to talk to you. The link to purchasing of Bears and Ballots and my guess is Heather's other books as well can be found in the chat. Um, so go there and buy the book. And I don't know if they're signed. I don't know how we're doing that now. Uh, but please do. I can't recommend this book enough, especially now. And um, Heather, I just want to thank you so much. This has been a delight. Thank you. It's really been nice to meet you after reading um, your book. I'm going to pass your book about grief on to my uh, local hospice. Please do. I think it'll really help people right now. Please it's do. a wonderful resource. Please do. Oh, you know, are you still writing obituaries for the Chilcat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't write them all. There's staff do some. I didn't do, there were two last week that I didn't do because I was doing all this book stuff, but I'm going to do one for next week's paper. Okay. This is the thing about you. It's not a formal book talk so much as it's just like, I don't know, just <laughs> hang out. And Heather's book is very much that way as well. So thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank the Atlanta Center for History. It's really been nice to be in Georgia. Yeah, welcome to Georgia. There's a rainstorm out my window. Oh, it's beautiful here right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heather. Bye. Bye-bye.